to worship at Windsor United Church on this uh, Christ the King, Sunday the 22nd of November. Our call to worship is based on Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Our first hymn is, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. thank you for your providence and your promises which sustain us and lead us to life. You are our life and our Redeemer. Thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself that we might have this life. We confess that we don't always live as if we have this life. Rather, we seem to live like we don't have a Saviour, but we do. And so we ask your forgiveness for the times that we forget all that you've done for us. And we ask that you stir within us that joy of our salvation 
that others might see that we are one and that we are yours. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The assurance of forgiveness, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Receive his unconditional forgiveness. Thanks be to God. God. Our Old Testament uh, reading this morning is Exodus chapter 34, verses 11 to 24. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Do not make any idols. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall labour, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the ploughing season and harvest, you must rest. Celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. And the Gospel, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And the reading from the letter, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Gilles. We just want to reflect a little bit on each of the readings. I'm going to start with the Exodus reading. We find um, Moses talking to the Israelites before they enter the Promised Land. And uh, he begins with those words, Obey what I command you today. So if you look at the passage immediately before this, it talks about the Lord making a covenant with uh, Israel. And so we have this special word in the Old Testament covenant. And uh, we find that Jesus is the new covenant in the New Testament. And so Jesus fulfills the law. We, we find that Jesus came to fulfill the law. And only in him is the law fulfilled because he... Uh, fulfilled all the requirements of the law on the cross. So when God talks to the Israelites about a covenant, it's to do with the relationship. And it's a very special relationship because it's the relationship that we have with our Creator, our Heavenly Father. And so this covenant is based on God's promises. God promises to be their God. And so a covenant, which is a special promise, a special relationship, a special re arrangement, is not just one-sided, it's two-sided. So God makes a promise and his people make a promise. God makes a promise to be their God and promises to love them and to care for them and to have compassion on them and to be faithful to them. And consequently, they make a promise also in that relationship. A promise to be true. A promise to love God and their neighbour. Because that's what the law says. The law, Jesus said, remember? The law is summed up in those, those two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. So there's no... There's, Nothing more to the law than that. That's the heart of the law, to love God and to love our neighbour. Everything else is covered by that. If you do that, then you won't steal or do any of the other things, cover all the other awful things that God forbids us to do, which if you look around the world, there's a lot going on. And so somehow we've got so off track that we've lost sight of what? God. 
We sin to the lost side of God. Why is that? How could that happen? But it has. What's even more incredible is that that's happened after God has sent his only son, his one and only son, to be amongst us, to live amongst us. With all our joys and sorrows, he lived it all. And he took it all to the cross. All of our sin, from every age, from every generation, he took that suffering upon himself. He took the punishment. He paid the price. His blood cleanses us. So we're going to get to that a little bit more in the, in the gospel reading, but I just wanted to, just to reflect a little bit on why Moses is so adamant about to be careful into this world into which you're going, these lands into which you, I promised you, and he says, don't make treaties with any of the peoples of the land, which seems an unreasonable thing to do. It seems a bit crazy, but then it, when you hear what Moses said about the way that they're living, you understand why he says that. It's not good. It's abominable, actually. When he uses words like prostitution and sacrifice, that's what's going on. As part of their ritual, and even child sacrifice, as part of their worship to their gods, it's beyond belief what's happening in the lands in which Israel enters. And so, why wouldn't God say, don't go there. Don't even think about it. Because you'll be in big trouble. And he's not just saying this for his own benefit, he's saying it for theirs. And that's the whole point of the law. It's not so that God imposes some awful way of life upon us that stops us from having any sort of fun. No. God is not like that. God is kind and caring and loving and full of fun. But the right sort of fun. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of the law. It's to protect us and to protect our neighbour. And so he goes on with things that we don't quite understand. He talks about bread and redeeming the first call. The, leaven, the bread without yeast was meant to remind them specifically of their time in Egypt. Their time of slavery, of hardship, and how God redeemed them, delivered them from that awful place and did amazing things to take them out of Egypt. And we remember the story of the Red Sea and what God did there. We've heard it in previous weeks and the journey that God has been with his people on. Those are the words, the key words of redemption and deliverance and, and coming out of slavery. And those words remind us, and for me they point to what Christ did also for us in his life, death and resurrection. We talk about slavery in a physical sense, but there's also slavery to sin and bondage to things that we think we'll never be free of. And yet Christ says, when the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. So all of those words have been picked up by Christ and brought into the light so that we can really see what they mean. But Jesus, the Lord makes a number of promises in that, in that passage. And he asks the people to make a number of promises about when he talks about appearing before the Lord and the festivals, the celebrating of the festivals. And we, we're a bit estranged from that. Yes, we understand festivals to a degree, but not in the same sense. But really, all that is, all of those festivals are meant to remind the people who it is who gives them life and all that they have to celebrate through all the seasons of life, both the hard times and the good times. That's the whole point of festivals, is to remind the people in whom and on whom they stand. And I think, you know, we need reminding too. And that's why we celebrate Easter and Christmas not exactly the same, but similarly in Pentecost. Very similarly. That's why we celebrate those things. It tells us our identity. 
Who is in Christ? Are we in Christ? This is the question. And that's, for me, the fundamental question of the parables. Jesus has been speaking these parables that we've been talking about in the previous weeks, and we come to another one today, and we ask ourselves the question immediately, who is Jesus talking to again? Because this is a really tough one, and he really lays it on. But who's he talking to? Because it seems like he's, we've said in previous weeks, he's talking to believers. Because if you follow it back from the beginning of those stories, those parables, it was the disciples that Jesus is talking to. And so we ask the question, is that who he's talking to? And we talked about this in previous weeks, and we, we wondered whether Jesus is talking to both. Because there's things that I think apply to both, as we talked last week about, remember the bags of gold? And how all of us are given, in some ways, yes, this can be taken literally, this story about, you know, the bags of gold and how they did different things. One had five and one had two and one had one, and the first two doubled it, and the last one buried it in the ground. And there's that parallel of, of our lives and how sometimes we we don't use the gifts that God has given us, all of us, not just believers. And so we came to the conclusion it can apply to both. And so as we come to the story of the sheep and the goats, and we hear those opening words, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, we're reminded of, sounds like the second coming to me, and, he, and the time of judgment, when he was sitting on his throne. So the first time Jesus came, as a redeemer, as a deliverer. Remember what John's Gospel said, he came not to condemn, but to save, so that all who believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the free gift that Christ offers to us all. There's no conditions. All we have to do is say yes. It's not complicated. Jesus is there, he reaches out his arm to us, and he says, will you let me into your life? And all we have to do is say yes. Because in that moment, something wonderful has happened. The Holy Spirit has convicted us of our sin, of our need for God, and we have repented. Which is really a simple way of saying we've decided to let go of control, of thinking that we know best, and allow God to be in charge. It's, repentance means to turn around it's to say sorry for what we've done and the direction we've taken, but most of all is to say, God, from now on, Lord Jesus, you're on the throne of my life. And throne is a word we're not familiar with from another era, but we know what it means, because we know what it means to have control, because we all want it. But Jesus says, that's not the best way. The best way is to let go and let me take control. Remember what he says? He's the good shepherd. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in spirit and heart. Jesus invites us to lay our burdens at the foot of the cross and allow him to put his yoke upon us. And it's not harsh wonderful. For well, he is the one and only, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And so when we hear these words of all the nations are gathered, this is the end of time, and everyone appears before him and it says he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd. Here's that word again, a shepherd. Remember the role of the shepherd to protect the sheep, to go ahead of the sheep and make sure there's no predators and enemies. The shepherd is the one who has a heart for the sheep. The shepherd is the one whose voice, remember, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice, they listen for me. The shepherd is a very special role. Jesus is the good shepherd. And then he says, he separates the sheep from the goats. And you think, oh boy, what's he talking about? But then all through the scriptures you hear the people of God being called the sheep of his pasture. 
So there's that, that picture of, of those who follow God as being his sheep. So in that agricultural culture, that word is very familiar. But to us, it's not so much. We are people of the city. But we understand a little bit of what he's talking about. And we get a little bit about goats are not so willing to, to listen and they're more following their own way, more stubborn, more unruly, more not really wanting to be gathered together. Whether that's fear on goats or not, I don't know. But that's, that's the way Jesus separates it out. That's what he says. Whatever you call them, you can call them something else if you want to, but he makes a distinction. And he puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and he, the king, that's him, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Why? Why are they blessed any more than the others? I think that the blessing comes if we allow it to come. The blessing comes when we open our hearts. You know? There's that aspect of allowing ourselves to receive. It's that saying, yes. I don't think that God doesn't want to bless anyone. He wants to. It's a matter of whether we want to be blessed or not. I think it's, it's about that. Take your inheritance. That inheritance was meant for everyone. Jesus died for all, remember? Once and for all. With no delineation. Delineation only comes because we've chosen it that way. That's the only way I can see it. Because God is a gracious and kind and loving God. And he wishes to bestow his favour on all of us. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he goes on and says some really strange things. And as you hear these words, you wonder, am I, am I like this? Do I do this? It's a hard one. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And the righteous, this is, I think, why they're called that, because they don't see themselves that way. They know their righteousness has nothing to do with them. They go, Lord, when did we do this? And he says, when did we do any of these things? When did we see you hungry? When did we feed you? When did we give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? I need clothes and clothes. When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king says, truly, I tell you, whatever you do for the least of these, for the least of these, brothers and sisters of my interesting way, he calls the least. It's a timely reminder to us of how God perceives things differently to us. These brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And he says to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed. Holy smoke. This is why this passage makes us cringe. We wonder, Lord, am I on the right or the left? Depart from me. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not do anything. I was sick and in prison and you didn't look after me. But they are, and they are bewildered. Lord, we don't remember any of this. What are you talking about? When did we see you in this place in this state, any of those things we don't remember. And he says, truly I tell you, when you did not do, or one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then he says those final words, which are really final, and they break your heart, then they'll go away to eternal punishment, with the righteous to eternal life. And it's a question that hangs in the air for all of us, doesn't it? we know that our righteousness has nothing to do with us and yet he calls us to live this way to examine our lives and ask ourselves have we closed our eyes to those around us in need 
do we have the character of Christ who, who when he saw need, his heart went out in compassion and he reached out and touched people, both physically and in a healing way, but also spiritually. Really, in three ways, Jesus touched people. He gave of himself just by being present with them. And sometimes even he allowed people physical touch. But then also where he saw someone in, who was sick and in need of, of, of healing, he healed people. He didn't just pass them by. He did something. And then when he knew that someone's heart was empty, he gave them himself and he filled them. And this is, this is what we are talking about before. This is the spiritual aspect of Jesus giving of himself as he came to earth. And, and still, that invitation, as we talked about before, is there for all of us today to receive Christ into our hearts, to feel that emptiness that all of us have without him. And then when we say yes to him, something changes within us and, and we're on a journey for the rest of our lives, a journey characterised, Jesus says, by this type of lifestyle, as he calls us, as he tells us, as he shows us where need is, where people are who need to hear the gospel, who need our help, he calls us into this lifestyle that we may not live this perfectly. But we, on this journey with Christ, I believe, he leads us where we're meant to be, if we'll let him. And I think, for me, that's the heart of this story. He calls his sheep to follow him and to live a certain way. And one day we shall see him again, face to face. Hallelujah. And that's why I think Ephesians really is titled Thanksgiving. Because we're so thankful. It says Thanksgiving and prayer, but Paul talks about firstly how thankful he is. I have not stopped giving thanks for you because of your faith and your love. And these two things characterize us who, who have been touched by the Spirit of God and love filled with the Spirit of God. And we, we may not believe it fully in terms of, we know that we don't always live perfectly, but I don't think any of us will do that until we get to heaven. But in the meantime, he calls us to lay down our lives as best we can and to confess our sins and to know that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness if we'll allow him to by his blood. And he's done that once and for all in our lives. And we continually keep short accounts with him. But we know that we, while we're in this mortal body, Paul said it was a, it was a battle. The battle with the flesh and it's not going to stop. So Paul remembers them in his prayers, and this is a, an example for us, that we all need to pray for each other, but we can't do this by ourselves or in our own strength. We need each other. We need each other to pray that God will give us the strength and the eyes, that our hearts will be open. And this is, Paul says, may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. If the eyes of your heart may be opened, enlightened, open, something new happens. You see in a new way that you never saw before. But you may know the hope is that beautiful word, hope. Some people don't have hope. That's why so desperately the world needs to hear the good news. That's why it's called the gospel. It's the good news. It's the good news that Jesus has conquered sin and death forever. It's good news. The riches of the glorious inheritance of his holy people, what is that? It's himself. He is our inheritance. It's not treasures what we normally think of. It's himself to know him and by he to know us. 
It's really better than that, to be known by him. The incomparably great power for us who believe is something we don't talk about much. There's power in the spirit. There was a song we used to sing that when we were younger. There's power in the spirit, there's power in the blood, there's power in his love. We forget that. The power that God has given the church. And it's not power in the normal way that we think of power. We think of power in a dominant way, but no, this is the sort of power that keeps giving when you feel like there's nothing there to give. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That wonderful love that God had for all humanity. That he would give his one and only son. And so Christ, we hear, he's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's our advocate. But we feel under attack. Know that he's there advocating for us. Cheering us on. And every power and dominion is in submission to him. Forever. It's a done deal. There's no turning back. It's over. He's been defeated. The enemy has been defeated. In the meantime, he's running around trying to take as many casualties and cause as much damage as he can before the end. But the truth is that he's been defeated. And we sometimes forget that. We think it seems it's so bad that nothing can be done, but it's not true. Because he's already done it all. We just need to realize that truth. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. We won't stop there. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for your mercy, kindness, and compassion way you watch over us through all generations. Your mercy which is unconditional for you gave this up to us freely of your own volition that all may know life. And we pray Lord, that your spirit may touch and reach out so that many, 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 many more will know this life, this abundant life that's found in you. Pray for all those who are struggling in themselves, who are struggling in their health, who are struggling in society, in our jobs. We pray, Lord, for communities that will be compassionate and understanding that this is not a journey we're on alone. That we travel this road together, we need each other. Help us, Lord, to know this. Bless this church as we head close towards reopening. Help us to get prepared and to, once again, as we have tried to be during this time, to be a light in our community. May we continue to be this by your mighty power. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is Take My Wife and Let It Be.